uh, in the panel discussion today, we have with us Professor M. M. Pant, who is who has been the Pro Vice Chancellor of Ignu University and is a renowned name in the education fraternity. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, next, we have with us Mrs. Sunil Kumar Lal, who is the Professor of uh, Microbiology at Monash University, Kuala Lumpur. Mr. Pramod Sharma, who has been the headmaster of Mayo Boys, uh, Ajmer, he's been associated with the Doon School and is currently the vice president of the Genesis Global School, Noida. Welcome, sir. Hi. Next, we have with us Mr. Kamlesh Mishra, Dr. Kamlesh Mishra, who is the vice chancellor of Rishihud University, Sonipat. We also have with us Mr. Sahil Agarwal, the CEO of Rishihud University, Sonipat. Uh, Dr. Jyoti Gupta, again a renowned educationist in the school fraternity who has headed the uh, schools like uh, uh, Delhi Public School, Ghaziabad. She's also been associated with school like DPS RK Puram and is currently heading her own school, Delhi Public School, Sahibabad. Welcome, ma'am. Next, we have with us uh, Mr. Sachin Mohan from the Great Learning Campus. Uh, welcome, Mr. Sachin. We also have with us Mr. Pramod Kumar from ISBM Pune. He is the president of ISBM campuses in Pune and uh, Kolkata. Uh, welcome, sir. We also happen to have with us Mr. Kevin Carvalho from uh, Delhi Public School, Bangalore East. He's a student of grade 12, has just appeared in his board examinations now, and fortunately has been able to complete all his examinations uh, of grade 12. Let us start sure. with Dr. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Kamlesh Mishra. Uh, Dr. Mishra, you have, you have taught, uh, I think, all across the world. So, as our topic is, can the online education replace the traditional education? Yes, sir. My, my personal view is that uh, mm -hmm. I think that it is possible to replace. And uh, I, I was reading the piece that uh, uh, Professor Pant uh, uh, had sent, and it uh, my resonates very much with what he he has uh, written. Uh, I, I don't think that it is possible to uh, replace this completely because to me, uh, the online technologies are a mechanism to transmit information. Uh, and if we, if we accept that it is only a mechanism to transmit information, uh, and there, there, are, there are no emotions involved in it, uh, you know, given the situation that we are today, where we are connected from people, how does it feel? That's exactly the feeling that a, a, probably a student or a teacher may have when he's completely disconnected with, 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 with each other. So, you know, the current situation is a good example for us to see that when, when we disconnect people from emotions, then what... <laughs> I'm not against online education. I think it's a great tool to reach out to, to people that uh, may not be possible to reach in remote areas. Or we reach out, uh, the best of our teachers can go to places where nobody is willing to go. For example, if there is a college or university in rural area, they have a lot of difficulty getting teachers, good teachers. Maybe in that kind of situation, video conferencing or online education, uh, provides an access to great teachers to students who may not have that access. So I'm, I'm not against it. But if I say that uh, let's have online education in, in, in central Delhi, where everybody is flooded, uh, it can be a supplement like what we are having today. We, ha we have a major problem and we are trying to sort out uh, those kind of problems. Also what happens is that uh, there, there are lots of uh, teachers who are very fluent, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, age-wise, if you look at uh, Professor Pant, the kind of uh, 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 ideas that he brings uh, about online education and how artificial intelligence can be brought into it to make it more, more effective, uh, uh, not everybody is as, as uh, uh, good as, uh, as what he is. Uh, in fact, a lot of teachers have a lot of difficulty in, in delivering online education. And in the same way, there are a lot of students who have difficulty in going through online education. Correct. You know, there's a problem at both ends. Uh, we, we, uh, we have a lot of teachers who don't have uh, that fluency in, uh, with the technology. Uh, we don't have a lot of students who uh, feel good about the online. Right? 
So obviously we we have uh, problems, and I I still feel that, uh, the education system is not only about the degree or the course. It is the ability to connect with the student and allow them to learn from your own experience also. You know, if we if we believe in this philosophy that a teacher is a friend, guide, philosopher, everything, then online education will not deliver everything to you. So unless that there is a, I have always found that as a teacher, unless I'm able to connect with the student, I feel that I have not done justice to my profession. Right, sir. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Now I'd request Dr. Jyoti Gupta. As Dr. Gupta, you have done a lot of work with the government also in this uh, domain, and you have done a lot of physical teaching also. You have been teaching, I think, since you were uh, 19. And last year, you gave the India topper of CBSC class 12th also. Now, what is your view on the subject? Pranav, I uh, also feel the same that uh, technology is an aid uh, for a teacher, a tool for a teacher to teach. Yes, in these difficult times, uh, the technology is, uh, uh, you know, is a great aid to the teachers where they are keeping the children engaged by online teaching, etc. But don't forget, on the other side of the computer is a teacher who is teaching. <laughs> teachers are not there to teach the students. If the teachers are not there to prepare the content for them, then the children cannot prepare anything. The, uh, the EQ and the IQ that the teachers or humans have, the machines do not have. Even the artificial intelligence the bots that are created are created on the intelligence of the human beings. There, are, there is repetition, there is repetitive work, but then uh, the teachers are required to uh, think, to prepare the lessons, to see what kind of content is being delivered um, uh, to the students. So everything is required by a teacher. Uh, the toppers are not mere, uh, uh, you know, the students who can um, uh, who can just study on their own through technology. There is a lot of investment that the teachers have to do in the children who become the toppers. There are children who are studying out of schools. There are children who are studying online already. But you see a difference between the personality of the children who are coming to schools. Yes, the fabric of the school may change in the coming times. Uh, the children may come to the schools uh, more to learn collaboratively, more to learn with the peers. The role of a teacher is also changing today. The role of a teacher is not of a sage on the stage today. It is more like a guide by the side where she gently uh, maneuvers the class, where she takes the class through the entire experience. So technology is definitely an aid, but online learning will not replace all schools. More virtual schools may come up. More children uh, who uh, want to do uh, something simultaneously along with learning in the classroom. They may choose or opt for the online learning, but the entire um, uh, learning to be moved on to the online platform to be uh, replaced by the online platform. I don't think so. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Sachin Mohan, as you are work doing a lot of uh, work in this domain, what are your views? Mr. Sachin Mohan from <coughs> great, great Learning, part of Great Lakes. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving me this opportunity to connect with all the professional and honorable people here. Uh, sir, uh, I also actually agree slightly with both the panelists who have spoken, uh, Dr. Kamilesh Mishra and ma'am. Uh, basically, sir, we have to understand what kind, what is traditional learning and what is online learning, what we are saying. People consider online learning just as a kind of a tool of extension of a kind of a teaching aid so that they can reach out to maximum number of people who can't come to classes for a face-to-face -face interaction. Okay. People actually forget that online education is much more beyond that. that. Okay. Uh, we definitely aid in giving them the kind of uh, reach through the teach, uh, technology platform. But you have to also understand that the teaching actually happens in three ways. 
one is a lecture part one is a tutorial part and one is a practical part okay depending on the course which you are teaching so example if you are teaching an engineering course like a computer science or electronics or electrical it is divided into lecture tutorials and practical right lecture is a theory part tutorial is a kind of a mentorship part where is a doubt clearing session with the faculty conduct for the student and the practical is what the people do on hands on either it can be a project or it can be a workshop or it can be a kind of a test or chemical reaction depending on the stream that they are studying right so not everything can be replaced by an online education what what we my personal opinion is the lectures which are the theory part okay which remain same throughout the many years so i am a graduate of nsit i am a graduate of i am lucknow uh, we have been following the old traditional curriculum for so long the curriculum has not changed okay so the lecture content remain more or less the same okay throughout that can be easily automated and can be delivered to the students so that you also also understand who is the target audience now for higher education and for post graduation there are working professional who want to learn new technologies new things that are going into the there are new kind of people the new generation actually want more convenience they don't want to spend time traveling so i remember i used to travel one and a half hour from rohini to dwarka for my nsit classes i was a day scholar okay people don't want to waste that much of our time one and a half hours for traveling to a college okay people want to consume information and knowledge which are now available at the doorstep at their own convenience okay so lectures can be easily delivered to them at their mobile or at the desktop they can go through them then we can have tutorials which can be either face to face or live sessions by personalized mentors which basically helps them with the doubt clearing sessions okay that actually gives them the more kind of learning and understanding of the concepts and the third stage is the practical so now depending on which course which stream you are taking so for example if you are taking a computer science or electronics course this can be easily delivered through a online practical scenario you do not have to go to the campus to do so you just need a kind of an ecosystem where you can code a particular project develop it and deliver it however having said that for chemical for mechanical for uh, other core industry subjects or engineering subjects where you need a practical workshop you need to actually have that physical presence okay so what i am saying is so for subjects like humanities history uh, uh, medical where you need a more of hands on holding there a face to face teaching it makes much more sense what we also have to understand is in these changing times since the information is available to the student from all various sources and if we do not change or supplement the traditional learning with a new kind of online learning we would be left behind in india lot of foreign universities are trying to come back to india wherein they are ca capturing the market share of people who want to learn at their own pace okay at their own comfort they may be working they may be doing some part time work they may not be able to get full time education going face to face sessions they might want to learn at their own pace and that is where what we are seeing a change in trend that the people want to learn at their own pace basis doing their own work five, so five, i feel that in case how i would request like generally what what we do we forget the subject we forget the students for whom we we are discussing we have got kevin what is like you have you i'm sure you must have done offline learning also and online learning also what is your view on the subject true introduce kevin kevin is just given written his class 12 examination from delhi public school bangalore east yes kevin yes so dear respected members of the panel i feel that personally i've been um, a student of delhi public school bangalore east for the past 13 years and um, i've learned from various backgrounds i've also i've personally also done a lot of this online courses as well but truly i feel that uh, this human human interaction between a student and a teacher is very very crucial because um teachers can also they inculcate communicate it just depends on their communication skills their emotional support towards you their body language which i don't feel is very good via on a camera based application from student to a teacher i also feel that um when you're when you're doing this online based you also have a lack of discipline uh, responsibility and commitment towards it i because when you're doing a course from a very long time like suppose for example this online thing has come out recently and that's why it's so interesting and so fascinating for all of us but i feel if it was the other way around and that schools were something different 
we would have had the same discussion on that very own topic. I feel that even though um, even though this um, online thing is very new, I feel that we should wait for a time and wait for some more time and ponder about the ideas which come from uh, this online teaching. Mr. Pramod Sharma, sir, I think you have done a lot of offline teaching and you have very nicely blended things in the online also. Sir, what are your views? And after you hear Kevin also. Uh, I fully agree with what has been said till now. Kevin has emphasized uh, that uh, the, the connect between a teacher and a student is most important. And uh, I firmly believe being a person from residential schools that the connect that a child has with a teacher uh, is extremely important for him to learn anything. We continue to say that there is no failed student. There is always a failed teacher or a failed school behind him. And that is because the teacher has not been able to inspire that student. Uh, there are many ways to bring in life experiences, to, to bring in a little humor. Uh, there is no doubt that in today's world, anybody would deny that technology is not going to be part of uh, school education. But here, mostly we are talking about academic curriculum. All the discussion till now has been mostly about academic this, you know, content and academic delivery. But ultimately, the life skills, the problem solving skills, they are extremely important. How a child behaves in a particular situation when the chips are down. And this online education in these troubled times has become extremely important. And I see it as a challenge because many schools do not have that kind of technology in place. This is the time when they can come back and put that technology. There are umpteen number of schools where technology is in place and teachers are responsible. If all teachers, not all teachers, but at least a large number of teachers, not everybody can be professor who can at this age be ahead of the young people in technology. Most of us have our limitations and but I look at the current scenario as a huge challenge for teachers, for schools to deliver online training. Mr. Sahil Agarwal, who is the CEO of Rishihood University, and he did his 10, 12th and graduation a couple of years back only. I think he's the right person. Mr. Sahil, what are your views on the subject? Uh, thank you, uh, Pranavji. Uh, I, I uh, yeah, most welcome, appreciate sir. the thoughts that uh, all the panelists have shared so far. Uh, I think uh, so. Online is not going to replace offline learning, but I think a lot of principles of online learning are going to fundamentally change offline learning forever. And this does not mean that uh, we'll start uh, you know, the the importance of uh, in-person interactions between teachers and students will go away. Uh, but uh, but the the offline the formal structure of education is based on some principles, and I think online education is going to change those principles. So why I say that is is one of the principles in online education is. Uh, choice based. So the student and the faculty has complete choice on when they want to teach, what they want to teach, uh, how they want to grade, uh, how much they want to teach, uh, where they want to teach, uh, similarly for the students. So the formal structure of education does not provide this kind of flexibility yet. Uh, another principle is uh, we can uh, choose the quality. It's not The quality is not given to us. Uh, in, in online system. So as you know, Kevin is studying uh, there, uh, so there may be some teachers in other schools not available to his school who are excellent in their subjects, uh, but Kevin wants to learn from them. Uh, so uh, in online, all this is possible. Uh, what I'm assuming is in offline also, people will be able to build their own degrees and build their own uh, you know, uh, curriculum. So if a person of Kevin's age wants to attend one subject in a particular school and another in another school, I think that's going to be possible. Similarly, for degrees, I don't think students will be res uh, uh, restricted to study the entire four-year program from a single university. They should be able to choose subjects of their choice, faculty of their choice, and that's uh, going to happen. Um, add to it the possibility of uh, dynamic and real-time assessment. Uh, 
online has you know that uh, that ability uh, that you, they can give you uh, real time input on whether you are able to understand the subject and customize your curriculum based on that but in offline uh, you know, there is a lag of 5 6 months if you look at a semester or or the entire year uh, if you look at the annual exam uh, so that's too late to know whether the student has really understood the subject or not uh, right so <laughs> right correct is also going to change yeah so these are my some of my thoughts Uh, Dr. Jyoti Gupta, you did did lot of things with the government, uh, government and CBSE in terms of online learning. So, yeah, I, I, how was the experience, ma'am? Can you? Uh, the experience was very good. Actually, Diksha platform was started by the MHRD a couple of years ago, and there was not much content which was there on the. Uh, Diksha platform, but last year when we started working with the CBSC, uh, we contributed about eighty percent of the digital content on the uh, Diksha, which was later known as uh, renamed as Vidya Dal, and uh, we had contributed the uh, lesson plans, the lesson transactions, the mind maps, the. um the also the videos of the uh, teachers delivering right the right. lectures right. then uh, the when the vidyadan was launched with the content 80% of the contribution was done by me and my team and uh, the day the trial was launched for about 10 days there were lakhs of people who were actually already uh, coming on the platform uh to make use of the content that was there so again uh, the lesson plans there were helping the teachers curate their own lesson plans the competency based lesson plans the lesson transactions which were there were also helping the teachers to prepare the content for their own children now whether that is used online or it is used offline by the teacher in the classroom is actually left on to the teacher and um, uh, india is not about metropolitan only where there are children who can uh, uh, learn in whatever format you give them uh, to learn if you tell them you have to learn online the parents are also ready okay. to get the devices for the children uh, to for them to learn online uh india is about the remote um, uh, districts also where the connectivity may not be there where the uh, devices um, are the distant possibility for the children uh, where they may have a phone but they may not have uh, the connectivity on the phone to download all the content that is required to be downloaded so uh, offline teaching also through the vidyadan was possible that the teacher only had to download what content was there that was also like an aid to help the teachers more than helping the students correct thank you so much ma'am i would request uh, mr sunil kumar from monash university uh, malaysia really good discussion going on here uh, with all the panelists and of course like all of us agree we are all going through a very steep learning curve because we are all traditionally trained to be doing face to face classes you know we've been doing that for ages and <clears throat> now with with the current situation changing you know this uh, the whole uh, covid situation etc has added to this this whole pressure of trying to uh, explore online options it's very nice it's very good actually that we are doing this because it certainly has certain advantages but of course like many of the panelists will agree with me that we cannot really it does not it doesn't change the the way and it doesn't change the advantages over face to face uh, teaching especially this whole idea of having <clears throat> a committed classroom where everybody is sort of like a captive audience you know somebody has come into a class he or she has dedicated that one hour to the teacher and plans to be there for that one hour right in in online one of the issues is that you know it's it's up to your convenience whenever you want wherever you want you can stop it whenever you want you can turn it on it's good but it has its disadvantages as well professor sunil and, professor yes. sunil we'll just have to go for a break and we'll come okay. again fine <laughs>
know, like I mentioned, that we are all going through uh, a learning experience with with the uh, uh, with the uh, clampdowns and the, the locking of of everybody at home. Now we are all trying to understand more and more how to use online uh, systems as a basis for communicating our our lectures. Um, it, it has its pros and cons. Like I mentioned, one of the biggest disadvantages is that we don't really have have a captive audience which we used to have in our traditional classrooms, where you know a student that walks in has committed himself or herself for, for one hour at least. It's even it's even more different. So uh, so here it's it's more like we are it, it's more like a one-sided communication where we are trying to express whatever we're trying to communicate through the lecture but we are not even sure if on the other side if the student is getting uh, getting the knowledge uh, to the you know to the right extent of understanding that we would like to have it so 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 that's one of the um, disadvantages uh, especially being um, uh, being a student of science i've always liked to have more interaction, more lab-based interaction, and that's what something that we are missing now. And it Correct. becomes kind of very difficult for us to try to, uh, you know, um, explain to students things that we would have actually done in the lab, especially for biological sciences. You know, in biological sciences, everything has to be done um, done at the bench. You know, it's very difficult to to make and so to make a lab-based experiment. So I think those are some of the problems that we are encountering. Uh, of course, like some of the panelists said, it has its advantages. The the extent to which the information can reach uh, remote places, you know, all those are very very good plus points to this whole um, to this whole new technology that we can adapt to now very quickly. So uh, so it has its plus and minuses. Yeah, I think I, I would leave it there. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pramod Kumar, Kept President of ISBNM. And the, you know, the institute has done wonderfully well. And uh, he had been teaching from last year more than 20 years. And they have got, I think, excellent placement. Yes, Mr. Pramod Kumar. And sir, just mm -hmm. uh, advise us more about, uh, on the subject, sir. Online is a very uh, accessible platform to access the students. The, uh, we use a blended method. We do use a lot of online. We also use... Uh, at the classroom, of course, it's a blended method. The uh, the challenge in online is the self-discipline on the side of the user. Okay, now the access uh, at a time when you uh, there could be a group interacting on online could be a big challenge. Uh, second important side of it is that the uh, uh, the online is much more challenging for the professor because the professors really must come out with the processes, methodologies, and the content, which makes us, which challenges a student much more. So, truly speaking, uh, in online, a professor has to work twice as hard as he uh, he or she does in the classroom. The uh, so that's a, another very important side of it because they must uh, design uh, methodologies every time, the content every time, the problems and issues every time. The uh, uh, I mean, if there are 60 students in the class, probably they need to design 60 different assignments for them to work on online and to work at different points in time. So that's a uh, I mean, there are bigger challenges. One limitation which, it is, which you have is it's very cognitive learning. Okay, so it's a primarily cognitive. Uh, the so if you want more action-oriented approach, uh, like in business, if you want them to learn about process of ex execution and all those, those issues could be challenging. While teaching on models, teaching on tools of analysis, teaching on uh, decision processes, all, all that are much easier uh, online. You can bring in high level of complexity. You can bring in high level of complexity and you can seek, uh, give them, give people flexibility to prepare and get on online. 
so uh, so that's a big advantage of it the uh, the, uh, the challenges are we actually need to work extra hard for that right uh, on both sides the teacher and the learner on both sides yeah uh, mr pramod sharma sir as kevin just pointed out like we uh, there is no discipline in a class if we are doing an online learning how should a student prepare himself or herself because nowadays i think we have to do a lot of online learning uh, it's very important like we are meeting at with zoom and everybody is here uh, so it is very important gets in and checks in at the right time what has been decided so the entire class is together so that kind of discipline still is required and if there is a reading material which has been sent by a teacher in the spirit of the flip classroom then that reading material should have been read by a student otherwise he will not perhaps gain as much so i am taking online class along with a physical presence class because both are online so that they there will be two ways in which online delivery can take place one is the where there is no teacher present and there is no uh, interaction with students and teacher uh, which is unlike how we are meeting today so that online delivery that is one kind of online delivery and the second kind is with zoom and their classes together maybe for 30 minutes and they have already read the background material and then there is a discussion and on the doubts that we have that that those doubts are clarified so i think both are equally important a uh, promoter i think you are a so chemistry promoter you are a chemistry teacher yeah i i am a chemistry teacher and uh, just coming back to chemistry then <clears throat> you see the the practical uh, subjects in this country i i i've often said that has become a part in practical as far as practical examinations are concerned the marks everywhere in every school out of 30 are given between 28 29 and 30 30 to those who are the best, best. students also the worst students so that it can compensate <laughs> in the theory marks that they get less wonderful so this is the story of every school in this country i was for a, for a decade on cbse governing body and i continue to say the same thing that it is possible to have a a paper a theory paper which is alternative to practicals which children will not be able to answer unless they have actually done practical work in the classroom correct but it was accepted to an extent that it was meant the suggestion was meant for class 12 but it was accepted for class 10 in which now for many years there have been one or two small questions for uh, which are practical based okay. but idea is that children should be forced to go for experiential learning and must go into the lab and must do the lab work and then we complain that iits are not doing any producing any new knowledge or uh, or there are no innovations coming out and no patents coming out i think the uh, the cbse and the national bodies must get get their act together and first they should be willing to take risks the right. risk is that they are so afraid mortally afraid of the results going down the higher percentages pass percentages which mean i do not know what but they are so afraid of that and that's why they take half measures they go two step forwards and then stop don't go take the entire journey together right sir sir as you are a chemistry teacher i had a problem in electronic configuration valency and all so and i used to you know feel pretty bad about it one day a temporary teacher came to our class and he was speaking in hindi he wrote hcl on the board एंड सेट यार क्लोरिन तो रो रहा था एक इलेक्ट्रॉन कम है हाइड्रोजन ने कहा आजा भाई साझा कर लेते हैं एंड सर इट गॉट सो सिंप्लीफाइड फॉर मी 
and I scored <laughs> highest in chemistry after that. Yeah, connect that connect with the uh, with a teacher is so very important. That teacher uh, knew how to make a poor learner learn faster, or how right. to <laughs> make him understand. So that is where you stand, Pranav. Good, good one. <laughs> now, now I would like to come to Jyoti, ma'am, again. She has done a lot of work on experiential learning. After that, we'll go to Mr. Pro Professor Pant. Yes, ma'am. As you have done a lot of work on experiential learning. Yeah, we've. Uh, uh, I've actually front-ended uh, writing the manual for uh, the CBSC on experiential learning. Actually, Pranav, uh, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, our uh, national board still now have uh, promoted rote learning. Now, rote learning because uh, everything around us is so repetitive and the children's exams, the assessments, the evaluations uh, that happen in our country is actually knowledge-based. And if uh, the children have to uh, write uh, um, uh, answers which are competency-based, then they have to go through the experiential learning. When you talk about the experiential learning, it is using your own five senses to learn. So for that, it is important that the children go through the entire learning experience with their own body where the, concept of the, uh, where the concepts will get cleared. It is not going to be through the books that the competencies are and the skills are going to come in. So uh, it's not just about the experiential learning, it is also about the assessments because most of the learning in the classroom is driven by what kind of assessments are going to happen. If the assessments are still going to be repetitive and they are going to be knowledge <laughs> or understanding based, then experiential learning has no meaning because at the end of the day, the teachers are teaching the classes not so that the children gain knowledge, unfortunately, but they are teaching the children so that they get marks. And uh, till we do not um, uh, move away from this focus of marks, actually the, um, the focus on the experiential learning is not going to come in. So CBSC, uh, because again, India is going to participate in the PISA, uh, in the forthcoming PISA exams, and all the um, uh, all the questions that are asked in the uh, PISA or any benchmarking uh, um, exams is uh, a competency-based question, or it is the questions which. Uh, 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 you know, are based on the observations. Our children, our country has not fared well in the uh, last PISA exam that we participated in. We did not participate in the last PISA exam, but before that, and we were only 72nd out of the 73 participating countries. That is because we do not um, have the assessments which are based on the competencies. We have assessments which are based on the rote learning. So uh, even our, uh, our competitive examinations are uh, based, uh, uh, you know, they are not based on the rote learning, but somehow the, uh, the, uh, the um, coaching centers have decoded them and they work with the children uh, on the speed and the accuracy of the questions that can be solved by the children in one particular given time. So that is why in today's time, it becomes important that we bring in experiential learning. It, it, it becomes important that the curriculum that is transacted in the class is in an experiential mode. Um, here, the schools which follow the IB system, uh, they uh, follow the inquiry-based curriculum uh, physics or maths or language at the end of the day remains the same but how is it transacted in the class how are the children uh, guided towards the inquiry cycle how are the children actually learning on their own becomes very very important and then it becomes important how to assess uh, the curriculum that has been so transacted Right. Both go hand in hand and that is why it becomes very important that uh, we move in with the current 21st century children who are uh, exposed to much more than the children 
you know of the uh, 20th century um, uh, children so we that's the need of the hour we need to move in towards the experiential learning right sir professor mishra sir yes sir the, is the absorption in uh, uh, school students and college uh, students uh, different in, uh, is it different between college students and uh, school, school students, students? Yeah, when they absorb the online education, I think uh, in general, uh, uh, I think we have moved to a, whether it's online or it is face to face. The attention span of this generation has uh, become very, very, very small, and and that's that's the reason that uh, um, you know when when we uh, talk about experiential learning, it is nothing other than trying to make it a student led process where they are actually engaged uh, i i i feel that in in today's world whether it is online or it is uh, uh, face to face education uh, i think the role of teachers has to shift you know we we can't continue to be information providers you know you can uh, uh, maybe a student like kevin doesn't need a teacher maybe they are self driven right correct uh, correct Uh, he, you you can go and deliver a lecture to him. He will come out and uh, download fifty PPTs of the same lecture from uh, internet. Yes. So as far as information is concerned, I think he has more information access to more information than we may. Have. Sometimes oh. they have uh, they have uh, at a faster speed than we we have because of our age groups. So I think what is more important now uh, is the ability of the the teachers to process that information, uh, and at the speed that they can process it and give it to the student. Uh, I have always felt that uh, students don't need to be taught in college; they need to be made to learn, and that's that that shift has to come from school into the college. They don't need to be taught; they need to be made to learn, and. I I believe uh, that when we go into that shift from a teaching to a learning mode, then every person inside that room is a learner. Some are at beginning levels, like Kevin, maybe at beginning level of learning process, and some of us who are the facilitators, maybe at an advanced level of learning. But right. we are all learning together, uh, you know. So we we talk a lot about experiential learning. we talk about project based learning we talk about all these things but we are not able to actually translate it into a reality and that's a fact so a lot of these things continue to remain as buzzwords right um, and my experiments with students has been that they they give you amazing results once you actually make them do things you know so unless unless i have always believed that uh, unless all senses of human body are used in the learning process learning will never be complete correct we cannot rely only on the sense of hearing you know i think 50% of all learning has to be by doing things you know and you can never forget how to ride a bicycle because you didn't learn it from a textbook true true and that's that's what we need I don't need to decide whether I need to apply the brakes in a car when something comes in front. No, it, it's just an impulsive reaction, right? Our our mind is uh, structured around around that kind of a, a system. So I I feel that students need to be engaged. Uh, you know, a lot of people say we need to motivate them. They don't need motivation. <laughs> unless we inspire students unless we work with them hand in hand you know we don't make that difference i found that the, the the as long as you are engaging with them directly right if you can touch their heart they will do amazing job if you believe and have faith in their ability they will come out with students it is for us to look into their eyes and say you have so much potential let's see the best out of you and you they will come out thank you so much sir uh, now yeah. i would request professor pant as acha i think uh, dr jyoti wants to yes yes jyoti ma'am so i just 
want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, say uh, that in schools, the pedagogies are changing. So we realize that if you tell the students, they will forget. But if you engage them, they shall learn and they shall uh, remember forever. So that is why uh, the pedagogies in the school are changing. And the collaboration amongst the students is becoming very, very important for the experiential learning. Because alone, if they work and they do not know how to work in a group, then that experiential learning is meaningless. So using their own body, using their own senses, um, and then collaboration with their uh, other peers, uh, it actually leads to uh, experiential learning in the classroom. So uh, there is also an integration of art and sports into uh, the curriculum, which, which then uh, brings in a different kind of an experience for the children. Till now, um, the uh, art, whether it is performing arts or visual arts and sports, were called the extracurricular activities. But now they have become a part of the curriculum. So music is used as a pedagogy uh, to teach other subjects. Similarly, maths uh, is taught, uh, uh, for example, the Pythagoras theorem can best be taught in the play field. So again, there is an integration of sports into the curriculum also. So that entire uh, integration of visual art, performing arts and sports and the culinary art, everything brings in an experience for the child and the child is using his own senses his own body uh, to uh, to learn so so that's where we are moving now thank you ma'am i will request professor fun i think he must have heard all section of all the stakeholders of education student teachers and there's a lot of them are parents also principals professors sir professor fun, i would like to have your advice for all of us He's professor, he's a lawyer, I think he was a pro vice chancellor of, chancellor of IGNU University also and he does a lot of online teaching also. Over to you, Professor Pan. Yeah, so thank you, Pranav. It has been a very stimulating discussion. Uh, I have been an early adopter of technologies, especially for education, right from the time of Skinner's program, learning and Plato as the software and so on. But I am a great proponent of the idea that it is the teacher which is most important, the professor which is most important. Actually, as you see in my note, my very first line says, this binary question is not a good question. That is this better or that better? And let me take you through a few important things. So I have been very lucky to have had very good teachers in person who have influenced me at Allahabad University where Kamdesha's father was a Vice Chancellor for some time. I had the privilege of studying under Dr. Muli Manohar Joshi, under Professor Iske Joshi, and many others. Uh, as I went out, I was influenced by Professor Zaiman, who not, did not teach me a class per se, but was part of a mentor group. Uh, then in Canada, uh, Professor V.Y. Tong. And what is most interesting is I consider Richard Feynman as my guru, as a teacher, and I wrote a letter to him in 1963 when he won a Nobel Prize because I had read his books and said, I am a pen student of yours because at that time pen friends was a good word, there was no online, etc. And he acknowledged that in a letter where he called me his pen student and that letter is published in a book by wonderful, him. Wonderful, wonderful. So sir. this is the point. The point is not online versus face to face. It is the influence and this is what Professor Kamlet Mishra also talked about. And uh, that is what is very important. Because this is a very distinguished gathering, I won't elaborate every point. I will just say a few things. Uh, one of the very important things is that there's a very famous book of 1902 by William James, who was a psychologist and a philosopher who talked about varieties of religious experiences. And he talked about varieties of religious experiences as the idea that several people have experiences which are almost like religious experience, although they are not following any particular religion. The future is about varieties of learning experiences for various kinds of people because all people are not alike. So the big change for me is from an educational system driven by authority, where 
as uh, Dioti said, that the teacher is the sage, sage on the stage and knows everything. Two, teachers fulfilling what people want to know, which it kind of talk guide by the side. And I would go further to say they are co-explorers in a pit. Both are in a mess and they're figuring their way out of it, like we are in the coronavirus situation. So the whole idea of teacher learner as teacher, one who has supreme knowledge and supreme authority and is kind enough to give you fragments of his knowledge is changed. We are co-explorers. This is another very, very important thing. Mm. I want to share the story of Einstein. When Einstein was teaching in Princeton, uh, as happens in most of these things, you have a small number of students, you make a question paper, give it to your teaching assistant, ask him to distribute to the students. And mm -hmm. when this teaching assistant looked at the question paper, he said, but sir, these are the same questions you gave to the same last students year. last year. And I <laughs> said, yes, the questions are the same, but the answers have changed. So what we are saying, and many of these people have said this clearly, that traditional education was for one kind of thing, and now we are into another one. I want to say a few salient features about it. The first thing is traditional education was when the past was well known, and the future was supposed to be an extension of the past, if not a repetition of the past. And that's why at that time, educated people were those who knew history and subjects like that. What we are talking today is preparing for an unknown future. So it is unlikely that the specific thing that you were taught you will use in those forms anytime. But you will use things based on what you have learned. And this was very well exemplified by the Harvard case method of management education, case method of law education. And today, this is what AI and machine learning is talking about. Machine learning is about training a model on a set of data to predict something new, not to re-echo that data and tell you back that this is what happened then. No, now, on the basis of it, and then depends upon how good you are. So in fact, uh, Jeff uh, Hawkins has a very nice thing that he says intelligence is the ability to make predictions. And all predictions are with incomplete data. Siddharth Mukherjee in his very good book called Laws of Medicine has written this, a life is about taking decisions on incomplete data. And an educated person is one who can take better decisions on incomplete data than a not so educated person. So this is a very, very important. The other important thing that is happening is the asymmetry of information. There was a time when the people in authority had access to all the knowledge. So if I was a well-known physicist in a certain area, I would know whatever latest is happening because I was part of that, either giving research grants, getting proposals, reviewing papers, etc., etc. But today knowledge is spread out much wider. And suddenly there is an asymmetry of knowledge. Your student may be more up to date than you, because you were busy giving this presentation discussion and he was busy browsing the Correct. internet. So this has been very well said by a doctor, Eric Topol. Eric Topol has a very interesting book called The Patient Will See You Now. The traditional model was the doctor, doctor will, see will see you, see you now. now. Now says, no, the patient will have all the data, all the information, rough model thing, and then will come to the doctor that can you help make me meaning of that. This is what the role of the teacher is going to be. The role of the teacher, as far as giving information, that is a very minuscule part of it that was essential to start the discussion. Sometimes we have taken that as the be all and end all, and that's why people were making MOOCs and so on, etc., are very happy. But this is meaning that tomorrow there will be a chip which will be planted in your brain or on your wristwatch, and that will have all the information. So mm -hmm. giving information is no longer the issue, it is making sense of the information and applying it to a certain thing. So this is the very interesting part that I'm saying. Now, so far the problem was that we were limited by whatever the human teacher could do. And many of us uh, would to speak from memory, would speak from this and extempore in class and so on, because they carried a lot of knowledge with them. Why I am a supporter of AI is that it helps an ordinary teacher become a great teacher. An ordinary teacher who may be forgetful, who may not remember, who may not remember the name, the year, etc., etc., the AI is there to help him. And therefore, we have to see AI as an assistant. This idea of somebody competing and outwitting is a mistaken notion. It is actually empowering. So, ordinary teachers who may, just like I say this very often, 
just like because i could wear spectacles i could become a better student in my career suppose the law was you are not allowed to have any wearable device with you and therefore i could not use spectacles i would not be able to do my education professor so kanta is that kevin has a question because it allows and i would request all of you to actually look at this book very seriously this is a book by anthony selden is vice chancellor of buckingham university and he is then in this book not philosophical discussion he says what are the five things that a teacher does in class what are the five things that a student does in class and how can ai help doing those things better the most important thing in my view is that apart from moving from authority to this thing we are moving from a passive learner to an active learner and this is a very big change that is going to happen so it isn't that you decide that this is what you need to learn and that i'll call you the learner with just like you go to a doctor with your disease which is it's a deviation from health i go to a teacher with my ignorance i say i don't know and it's for the teacher to construct a learning experience which may today for example everybody would want to know what is the difference between polio virus a retrovirus a corona virus and the hanta virus and everything right. that is well, you can't say you first pass the mbbs exam then you come to medical school then in medical school i will teach you so this is the democratization of learning that is started to happen and the other thing that is very important is that these things are getting connected so suddenly you realize that medicine and economics are intricately connected and this is what the new education has to be about new education has to be about not so many silos but maybe understanding first principles understanding connections and i will now go back to uh, pranav's favorite subject chemistry you see he <laughs> talked about bonding but a very more important concept in chemistry is valency to how many things does this atom can get connected and they are the noble metals they don't connect with anybody and carbon is the most active one carbon nitrogen phosphorus and oxygen they make what life is because each of these is connected to many other things our education was about silos if you are studying physics and chemistry you will not study biology you will not know what is dna rna etc or if you are studying that you will not know what is economics you will not know history you will not know literature you will not know philosophy the philosophy sociology psychology all this is connected so the more the valency of the educated person the more things he can connect with the better he will be able to relate to the world if you look at all the life molecules that is because they can form long chains of connected things of various kinds also the way they put together those relationships we have in the traditional education we have a straightforward method you don't allow unusual combination entire life is because of the mutations that happen people broke away from what the past was and did something else some of them survived some didn't those who survived were more successful but to have somebody who doesn't know what is evolution who doesn't know what is the immune system to do and i know many engineering graduates who have no idea where the liver is and what does the liver do now the point is you are eventually a liver yourself you have to live a life and you must know this i think this is a very very important aspect the future of education is breaking those compartmentalization etc and we are going to see a democratization of education sometimes when we talk about technology we make it appear as if it is something formidable and coming in the way and people say people don't have technology access all the technology you need today is a mobile phone and Correct. therefore any other thing that people are talking about is this is all right i also have been part of edusat and satellite launching and we have to have a studio etc now people are talking from anywhere and actually on my mobile phone from anywhere i can do this connection so i think the important point is i'm going back to what both kamlesh mishra and jyoti said in some sense in software we have a term called api application programming interface and most software developers are those who are good with apis the other api that you are hearing today is called the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the fight against mm-hmm. corona and other diseases <laughs> all drugs have lots of additional things but the key thing which makes thing happen is called api the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the same way if you forget all the trappings of how big your campus is and how beautiful the campus is how many are old your campus is what is important for learning is the api 
and the API is the act the effective pedagogical ingredient. So what uh, is the active uh, pedagogical uh, ingredient in your learning uh, is what uh, matters. We can uh, this <laughs> So we'll have to go for a small break. Okay. Then then I can back. wrap it up. Then no, 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 no. We don't have much time. Sir, sir, there are many questions also. I think Kevin also wants to ask you some questions. Okay. So let me just complete this part. So the API sir, that sir, matters, it, sir, it won't be complete. Active pedagogical interface, no matter what model you use. Okay. <laughs> You can yes, uh, ask your question to uh, Professor Kamlesh Mishra. He is the Vice Chancellor okay. of Vishwood University. Thank you. Um, so dear panel, I would like to ask you a question. So in, um, in today's world, um, schools and universities, they usually ask uh, students to be more practical based instead of, you know, just being a book based. And also I have another one, which is about talking about co-curricular activities. <laughs> to be honest, mm -hmm. I, am, I am a very co-curricular person. I am one of the most senior most ranks in NCC and I'm also I go for a lot of theater and music festivals. So my question to you is how do you think online learning will be able to cope up in this industry? Kevin, uh, I, I think when we, uh, we talk about education today and I think most of us are moving uh, in that direction which is, which is the line that you have taken that it is not just the, the uh, acquisition of knowledge and the degree program uh, it is something beyond that, something uh, which is more holistic in, in, in its application. And obviously, uh, that's where the problem with on learning uh, happened because if we, uh, but that, that probably would be a case once we have a 100% shift to online, uh, which in my view is going to be very, very uh, difficult. I, I, in the present scenario, probably online would be a, a very good model for those who are uh, working and they want to advance their uh, uh, qualifications, uh, but without leaving the job. It may be very useful to uh, uh, people who are going to open schools or those that are uh, uh, into correspondence programs, which, which uh, where online could be help. So the, these probably would be sort of a 100% shift to online. Uh, I still feel that the overall personality development of a student will depend on uh, the uh, beyond beyond the course, beyond the uh, knowledge base, beyond the degree uh, that happens, and where extracurricular activities form a very very important part in the overall development uh, of a student. So I I totally agree with you that online will never be able to do that. Uh, because you cannot have extracurricular activities being done on, on online. Uh, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big champion of online education. I, I have not, nothing uh, uh, against it. But I feel it has its own limitation. And, and I agree with what uh, uh, Professor Pant, who has been one of the leading figures in, in this area, just said that uh, it's not about this or that. Uh, I don't think they are competing, and I don't think that they should they should compete. Both of them have uh, 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 their place in the. It should just be an aid. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I would encourage students to uh, involve themselves in in going beyond their classes, and and that is it is very difficult to do it online, uh, uh, and and therefore you know I I agree with you. I think that. That's uh, important, and good that you 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 uh, have always been beyond the class. Thank you, you sir. thank you, <laughs> Professor Pant. Can you just uh, conclude the speech? See, what I was saying is, let us not get distracted into what is the mode of teaching. Yeah. Because sometimes people feel that the mode is what is important. What I'm saying is, no, it is what teaching is happening which is important. Correct. And good mm -hmm. teaching can happen. Many of us have learned from books. There are certain books that we have read of people with whom we feel related, even though we have never met him. So Bertrand Russell is one such person. I've read so much that I feel that I know him, although I've never met him or he has taught me. So this is the basic point that people who influence you is what is very important. And influencing can happen in various ways. 
also the whole idea of an authority determining what education you should have for how long is absurd. Uh, this was a time when some part of industrial age when you said I need so many engineers, so many doctors, so many this thing. Today it is a very different thing. This is completely unknown. And the key difference that has happened, and many people are saying this, is we have to educate people for the unknown on the basic general assumption that an educated person will be better able to handle problems than an uneducated person. Correct. And therefore, education for the unknown. And people like uh, Guy Claxton, uh, John Holt, they have said, what we need to create is curiosity, a desire to learn, and then wanting to learn very well, not just to pass exams. So when I know something, I should say, be able to say, I know and I know that I know. It is not that any number to 90% are there, but don't ask me anything, which is what happens very often. <laughs> so this is the point that we are saying, because now education is actually, the whole idea is that an educated person is in a better position to solve problems than an uneducated person. This is the, and the problems are not just employability. Uh, so in some way I go, somebody said, no, we will become jobless. So I said, no, joblessness does not matter. You should not be worthless. So you have to be useful. And if you are useful, somebody will find a way of reciprocating you. So right. that is not an issue. And many people who are worried about the prospects of this thing, and the, the, these industrial structures may not remain. Most See, the whole idea of a corporate is about a few hundred years old. Companies act as a few years old. Solomon versus Solomon and company was the leading case in corporate. Today, we think if the company is not there, what will we do? We, for thousands of years, there was no company. Thousands of years, there was no share market. So the idea that share market collapse and company collapse means havoc for humanity is a mistaken notion. That was created at a certain time. It did it usefulness at that time. But as we move on to another one, completely new orders will come in. I am a Correct. great believer that we will learn from chemistry, how people combine, how they live together. And kind of like that idea of HCL complementing each other. This is how <laughs> groups will form. Groups will form with talents and resources which complement each other. And people who have greater valency will be greater connected to a larger number of people and therefore they will end up creating other clusters. This whole idea that existing system will continue, uh, when we look at the sort of you know, date of birth of many of these things, you should realize that they cannot be uh, too long. The other thing of course is that there are principles for this and uh, uh, JBS Halden has a very good essay again written 100 years ago on being the right size. And he talks about that when things grow, there are forces that keep them together and forces which bring them apart. And the balance okay. of these forces is what determines the right size for a certain thing. So these are the kind of things. And one of the things that I do, and I uh, write a blog every Friday now. I used to do it erratically, but for the year 2020, every Friday I've been writing a blog. And the last one I wrote was on first principles. That rather than lots of details, let's people should focus on first principles. And although this was said by people like Socrates and Aristotle a long time back, but Elon Musk has said this way. So when Elon Musk was not able to get knowledge about space rockets from the Russians, he said, let's go from first principles. So the whole idea is that we need to create education, which is not so much in terms of the details, but in terms of the general conceptual framework and thinking abilities and so on. So when people talk about skills, I always feel that the skill to think clearly is the most important yes, skill. Most important. The other skills will then follow. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, okay. Mr. Pramod Sharma, Kevin has a question for you. Kevin, you can address your question to Mr. Pramod Sharma. Mr. Pramod Sharma has been the headmaster of Mayo Boys School and he had been done, seen, a lot of co-curricular activities, extracurricular activities because it was a residential school. Kevin, you can ask your question to Mr. Pramod Sharma. Okay. okay. So in, um, in today's world, <clears throat> universities and schools usually um, ask students to be practically smart and not book smart. And another thing is about co-curricular activities. And um, me being a very co-curricular co person who is part of NCC, one of the senior most ranks in NCC and gone for almost every theater and music festivals, I would like to ask you a question about how online learning will be able to cope in this industry. 
I think online learning, <coughs> there's no contradiction as Professor Pant was explaining, there's no contradiction between online learning and holistic development. Online learning at, the, at this point of time is more mainly concerned, mainly we are talking about academic learning, but even for in the co-curricular field, you can, you have all kinds of videos if you want to learn a game, if you want to learn an instrument, if you want to learn about appreciation of, uh, of films, uh, you know, everything is today available online and you will get online videos to be from the great masters to be able to uh, take you through their online courses available for everything. Uh, so, <coughs> I think there is no contradiction there. You can you can develop yourself holistically and still using online resources that are available. Uh, we continue to mention sports as uh, co-curricular activity, but you know I'm a little skeptic because uh, in a country where uh, most of the school uniforms have a tie and a shirt and a leather shoe. I do not know what it means to have a sports period, how these children can play any sports, correct, correct. and how they expect to play any I think this country has to figure out the act. Thank you so much. I would like to thank Mr. Sunil Kumar. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sachin, Dr. Jyoti Gupta, Dr. Kamlesh Mishra, uh, Mr. Pramod Sharma, Professor Pant, thank you so much.